businessman Stephen Kilage urges Land Minister to deal with corrupt officers. Election petitions served on members of National Alliance Party. Calls for a stop to exploitation of Pacific fisheries. This is National MTV News with Meriba Tulo. A very good evening. Thank you for joining us for Friday's news. More concerns have been raised regarding sale of land in Port Mosby. A concerned resident, Stephen Kilage, said land's officers continue to exercise fraudulent deals within the department. Mr. Kilage says those facing similar issues must expose such officers. Mr. Kilage told MTV News he has followed all procedures to apply for the land. However, he alleged that officers from the land's department gave the title to another party. After spending over 100,000 kina, um, my title was basically given to one of the want ofs. Now, I appealed the, de the de decision and I only got a letter yesterday uh, from the appeals officer saying that I was unsuccessful. The piece of land Mr. Kilage is applying for is a land along the Koki Drive. It's been seven years for Mr. Kilage, who got approvals from PNG Power, Edaranun, and other authorities in the city. Kilage is not taking this matter lightly. Normal Papua New Guineans have been shafted by crooked people in the Lands Department, uh, doing their own crook deals and getting money. Now, I myself, I'm going to be exposing every crook uh, public servant that's working in the Lands Department. Mr. Kilage has presented his case to the minister responsible, Justin Chachenko. In an off-camera interview yesterday with Minister Chachenko, he says the matter is serious and will be dealt with. Recently, MTV News interviewed Police businessman Richard uh, Peke, who bought a Mr. piece of land for 400,000 kina from business giant TSD. However, he found out that there is no official landlord. Since I'm already paying 400,000 and he gave me the fake title, and so that's, that can cover the agreement we signed. But I will go through the system now, go through the procedures, requirement for the lands department to get a title for this land. Mr. Peke is also disappointed with officers from the lands department who carry out crook deals. I appeal to everyone out there who's been shafted by the lands department, put in your complaint, uh, find out who's been hijacking your process, expose them on the thing, let's get them all arrested. Meanwhile, Minister Chichenko told MTV News over 60 cases have been reported to the new land fraud and complaints unit. He says more is expected. Jack Lapava Jr., National MTV News. A total of seven MPs in the National Alliance have been served election petitions. The latest this afternoon was Maprik MP John Simon. The MPs welcomed the petitions, saying they will let the process take its course without any interference. The seven MPs include party and opposition leader Patrick Pruites. Party leader uh, Patrick Pruites, the party president Walter Snowbelt for Namatanai, uh, Ian Ling Starkey, the member for Kavian, has been served. Robert Naguri, the member for Bogia. Saleh Waipo, the Angoro member, and the member for um, Nuku and the member for Maprik. Sir Arnold, speaking as the party's legal counsel and a candidate in the recent election, said they have welcomed the petitions and also will file a total of 11 petitions against other elected MPs. James Yali for the Madang Regional seat, Edwin Buffet for the Raikou seat, myself for Sumkar, Ank Matmai for the Sundown Regional seat, uh, Jimmy Simitab for the WeWork Open, uh, Malakai Tabar for the Gazelle Open, Richard Rafa for the Ambuti Drekikir, Michael Singan uh, for the New Island Regional, Dr. Professor Misty Baloloi. For the Maprik MP who was served his petition this evening, says he is confident and urged his supporters and the people of Maprik to allow the court process to take place. My win has been disputed and I will allow the court to <coughs> handle this. And I appeal to all my supporters and family to leave it as it is. We'll allow the court to, uh, to deal with this and we will all respect the decision of the court. Meanwhile, party leader Patrick Pruitt stressed on the negative impacts of election petitions. While the election petition is uh, being argued in court, you will find that 
uh, there will be less activities taking place in the electorate because the members' time will be uh, absorbed in defending their win. Uh, so please don't feel let down. Pruites added the party will defend the MPs petitioned. I can assure uh, our people in that our party will work closely with uh, our members of parliament to defend a win because we believe that we've uh, gone out to the election and we've done solid campaign to be elected. Again, I stress that it is important that the process is completed and we have just invited the petitioners to come. Stanley Ove Jr., National MTV News. Still on the National Alliance, party leader Patrick Pruaich has confirmed Ijivitari MP Richard Masere has made known his intentions to move to government. However, Pruaich says Masere is yet to meet with the party executives to discuss further on his decision. National Alliance as a party has its protocol to be observed and uh, we would like to reach it to sit down with the party in terms of uh, uh, following our party requirements if you decide to resign from the party. Uh, until that happens, uh, National Alliance will not release any of its members. So we uh, are, are waiting for the Honourable Member for Jimmy Tari to uh, uh, to, to, to present himself to the party and for us to uh, deal with the matter. The National and Supreme Courts are in the process of upgrading records such as court documents and court recordings using a digital recording system. Chief Justice Salomo Injia says the system has replaced the old analog system which will see national court sittings in every province upgraded to digital, digital status. The Chief Justice made these remarks during the opening of the 3 million kina renovated and refurbished national court building in Madang today. Chief Justice says Salomo Injia says they have also trained court staff who manage the technical side as well as the recording and production of the transcripts. The course covered the building and renovations that were done in the last four years as well as equipment and additional staff. We don't have the full capacity in terms of providing running transcript like daily transcript for those who want to receive uh, typed court uh, recordings. We don't have the capacity to produce what is called running transcript. In other words, it's available. The type transcript is available on the very same day or the next day. We have a few capacity issues, but we do provide a quality recordings and transcripting uh, of recordings. The refurbished building was made possible following a request to the Office of the Chief Justice by the resident judge of Medang, Justice David Kennings. Sesalamo Injia went on further to say Medang has done well in terms of this kind of service, while other provinces are still lacking. And our recording system and the service we provide is of, of, of high standard. In fact, among the best uh, recording uh, systems around the, around the world. But this national courthouse won't be the last. The Chief Justice in his speech this morning says they are awful a new regional court complex will be built for Medang. Medang has a plan to build a good modern court complex. And it is going to be a one-stop court complex. Mata Luis, National and TV News, Medang. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill is urging a stop to the current exploitation of the fisheries sector across the Pacific. O'Neill said the government has reached a point of correcting inappropriate practices by big companies who have been taking advantage over the years. He made these statements at the 48th Pacific Leaders Forum in Samoa. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill was in Samoa this week for the 48th Pacific Leaders Forum. Meeting other Pacific leaders, Mr. O'Neill wants to see the Pacific benefit more in the fisheries sector. He says big players in the fisheries industry must stop the current exploitation. The Prime Minister said the government reached a point where enough was enough and is now making deliberate interventions where exploitation is taking place. Mr. O'Neill says the Pacific holds a vast wealth in its waters and something must be done to create jobs, increase revenue collection and stimulate a better dialogue in the Pacific. 
A key change will be the reviewing of all licensing arrangements with each country in the Pacific. PM O'Neill hopes the forum will conclude with better understanding between countries to protect the wealth of the Pacific and its resources. Jack Lopava, Jr. National, MTV News. Yeah, with National MTV News in the news ahead, cultural festivities in the lead-up to Independence Day, the closing of Literacy Week, and BSP supports International Peace Day. The details after these messages. Welcome back to National MTV News. Coinciding with Papua New Guinea's 42nd independence anniversary, the IBS University today hosted its Cultural Day. This is the first Cultural Day event since the education institution was elevated to university status from its well-known days as the Institute of Business Studies. The IBS University is one of Papua New Guinea's national education institutions recognized in December last year through a decision by the National Executive Council. This tertiary institution has added to the list of universities operating in the country to seven. Today was history as IBS hosted its first cultural day as a university. <laughs> Students took pride in the traditional ties and performed traditional dances. From highlands to the islands. Southern to Mamose. The IBS University is a private tertiary educational institution passionate about developing Papua New Guinea's human resources, established as Institute of Business Studies or IBS in 1989. It has given more opportunities to school leavers rejected by the formal education system. Its vision to be a world-class educational, training and research institution and community oriented and one of them is for students to take pride in the cultural values and identity. Fabian <laughs> Hacklitz, National MTV News. Secretary for Education Dr. Oke Kombra says eradicating illiteracy and inumeracy is everyone's responsibility and not just the government's. More effort is required from every sector of the community to raise the level of literacy in the country. One organization that's helping underprivileged children in Ley is the St. Mary's Catholic Literacy School. The school ended the National Literacy Week today on the theme Quality Literacy, Quality Life. According to the 2010 PNG Household Income and Expenditure Survey report, there is an increase in the national youth literacy rate. There is a lot of young people and adults in the country who are eager to be educated. The St. Mary's Catholic Literacy School in Ley is an institution established 10 years ago. This school assists young people to be able to read and write. Uh, it is very important for uh, people like today, young age, if they do not know how to read and write, and if our old person, somebody who's old, mm, uh, who has gone through basic education and seeing these little children not having formal education, is that is not good enough. So basically we take them in just to help them to read and write. That's the whole purpose behind it. The vision for literacy in PNG, consistent with the national literacy policy, is that education should not exclusively be perceived as a passport to a paid job. Education, or to be literate, is about empowering life so that learners acquire cognitive and productive lives. Just like these young people here, they come from different backgrounds with different stories to tell. This year, all the mangi mi school want them assembly on the staff people want them to go to Saint Francis, Saint Joseph. Now go pioneer assembly trade. So go now go school now start now. Milugo say now 
Now we come back now. Milugo same working good. So we come back now. Now we school go. We la school go. Finish sister and number sali we go learn just Saint Francis or Saint Mary so one primary school too. Okay, now we come to school start. The government is doing its part in giving quality education to the children with the tuition fee free policy. But not all children can find a space in schools. With the help of such organizations, young people can be educated. Everyone should play a part in helping someone to be literate. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. Deadlines to register for Unitech and UOG's aptitude test will be next week. This is for grade 12 school leavers applying to Unitech and UOG for studies in 2018. Deputy Registrar for Unitech, Henry Govan, stressed the importance of the test, stating that only students who sit for the aptitude test will be considered for studies in the two institutions. The aptitude test, which was introduced last year, measures students' abilities to perform in tertiary institutions before they are accepted. The Papua New Guinea University of Technology is now into its second year of conducting aptitude tests for intending applicants. Students who wish to be considered for studies at Unitech are required to sit the test. Deputy Registrar of Unitech, Henry Giovin, said deadlines to register for the test is next week. And the deadline is on the 15th September for pre-registration and registration. Applicants for the University of Goroka will also be taking the test. For the University of Goroka, both the school leavers and pre-service non-school leavers for undergraduate courses should do that step P test. The aptitude test was introduced last year. This process was adopted to ensure a fair and more transparent selection process. This exercise uh, is really to, to ensure that we are are taking quality students. It is used by universities abroad and will measure students' abilities to perform in tertiary institutions. With the deadline set for next Friday, the 15th of September, principals of secondary schools are being urged to assist students applying to Unitech and UOG to register for the test. The test will be conducted in 10 different locations around the country from the 7th to the 9th of November. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lay. Bank South Pacific has come on board to support the International and PNG Peace Day celebrations in Port Moresby. The bank presented 20,000 kina to the Gutpla Peace and Sindan Foundation today. The Peace Day celebrations will take place on the 21st of September. It was a small but very significant occasion for staff of the Peace and Gutpla Sindan Foundation and BSP. With the International Peace Day celebrations nearing, the donation will go towards assisting the events planned for the day. So in line with the, the theme that we have for our community project, we also feel that this is fitting to support. And um, we hope that uh, PNG Peace Foundation and Good Plus Inan will continue that good work that they are doing for the community. Founder Wat Kiri says BSP has been supportive in the peace campaign. Really um, makes a significant uh, difference towards our fundraising activities to host this World Peace Day. It has been a challenge for the organization that operates on donations through financial assistance from stakeholders. Mr. Kiri says peace is also challenging in the country but believes everyone can be influential in maintaining peace. So you mean you need him one bell day, you mean all gonna come in one bell, lay down everything let peace arise in the hearts of everybody and let us all move forward with peace in our hearts, true peace. And it's very hard to achieve it, but please try it. The Good Luck Peace and Sindon Foundation have planned celebrations in the city, including a parade. The organization is also calling on other individuals or private organizations to assist spread the message of peace and create a better environment for all. We will have a program of activities, we will uh, send the programs out and uh, that day will be observed in Papua New Guinea uh, as a World Peace Day and uh, as a one bell day belong Papua New Guinea. The International Day of Peace is observed around the world as declared by the United Nations. Jack Lopave, Jr. National MTV News. 
The 2017 Bougainville Chocolate Festival has officially begun. The two-day festival was launched by Australia's Deputy High Commissioner, Bronte Mules, in Arawa. The event brings together cocoa farmers, chocolatiers, industry representatives and government officials to network and discuss market access, share improved farming and processing techniques. The festival is an effort by the Bougainville government and its stakeholders to revitalize the cocoa industry in Bougainville. The festival is an initiative of the autonomous Bougainville government led by the Department of Primary Industries in partnership with the governments of Papua New Guinea, Australia and New Zealand. And now a look at the finance news. The Kina closed unchanged at 0.3125 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying 0.305 US dollars, 0.375 Australian dollars, 0.2501 Euro and 32.7 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold, coffee and copper closed higher, while cocoa closed the day lower. Palm oil, crude oil and copper closed the day higher. And on the stock markets, the Dow Jones closed 22 points lower, the ASX closed 17 points lower and the All Ordinaries closed 14 points lower. Here with National MTV News, among stories making headlines overseas, powerful Hurricane Irma sweeping across the Caribbean. The details after these messages. Welcome back to National MTV News. Turning overseas now, Hurricane Irma, one of the strongest storms in recorded history, has destroyed almost everything in its path as it sweeps across the Eastern Caribbean. The monster Category 5 storm has claimed at least 14 lives and it's now moving on to the islands and is on track for a catastrophic struck on Florida. Tonight, the images now emerging of the utter destruction Hurricane Irma left behind. Buildings and trees ripped apart. This communications tower snapped. Hundreds now homeless. It was the worst time in all my life. And I would not want to see another hurricane like this again. Barbuda's prime minister telling ABC News it's as if a bomb was dropped on the tiny island, one of the first hit. Well, my main concern right now is how we're going to survive after this. St. Martin next in Irma's crosshairs. Shipping containers tossed like toys. Boats crashing together. At least 14 now dead in the storm zone, including 16-year-old Xander Venezia, drowning in rough surf off the Barbados coast. Irma's death toll expected to rise and scores more injured. Coast scenes like this one have been flying in and out of the Virgin Islands, rescuing people. Our cameraman on that chopper, capturing scenes of destruction as Irma moved across the Caribbean. We met Canadian college student Alex Demore, badly hurt in a fall in St. Thomas, airlifted to Puerto Rico for treatment. We lent her our phone so she could call her family. Mama? She and American student Maddie Gortat leaving the island with one pair of flip-flops between them and little else. The pair describing how they rode out the storm. We just didn't know if the roof was going to come off at any moment. So we were, praying. yeah, we were praying the whole time. Irma now moving in on the Turks and Caicos Islands, large portions of them at an elevation of less than 10 feet. The storm surge could be double that. I'm anxious about the storm. Uh, I've never been through a hurricane. California firefighter Josh Livingston there celebrating his birthday, now hunkered down and bracing for a Category 5 monster. Hurricane Irma is now the longest lasting Category 5 superstorm in recorded history, surpassing the Philippines typhoon four years ago. So why has it gathered so much energy? And why are these storms becoming more frequent? A menacing swirl of clouds stretching over the Caribbean. This view from space of Hurricane Irma shows its extraordinary scale. If it was over Britain, it would cover most of the country. A brave flight crew ventures right inside and facing them are the staggeringly large walls of the inside of the eye. This hurricane has set a new record for having dangerously fast winds for the longest time. On the ground, the effect is shattering. This part of the world knows all about hurricanes, and early warning has definitely saved lives. But this one is stronger than most. 
So how do hurricanes become so destructive? Well, the strongest, like Irma, form off the coast of West Africa. Warm waters cause the air to rise, triggering thunderstorms, and that's when the winds can start to circulate. As this weather system crosses the Atlantic, it grows and becomes stronger. And if the winds are all moving in the same direction at all levels, as with Irma, they reach devastating speeds. But then, closer to the Caribbean, the hurricane gets another boost as it passes over over yet more warm water and ocean temperatures are unusually high this year making the winds even more aggressive and on top of all this the low pressure inside the hurricane creates a storm surge a huge wave that strikes the coast and because climate change is raising the level of the sea the impact is all the greater as the people of the Caribbean try to cope with the terrible aftermath many are asking if there'll be even more scenes like this as the world gets warmer the conditions at the Libyan detention center are being described as a living hell with around a thousand migrants held in crowded conditions and subjected to daily violence. Crammed together in punishing heat, the migrants Europe doesn't want. Trapped in Libya, a country in chaos that doesn't want them either. Most traveled from sub-Saharan Africa some were stopped at sea, others on dry land. Now they are in Trigalsica, the largest detention center in Tripoli. We were given unfettered access to those suffering here. My guide, Hennessy, is 18 and from South Sudan, but for three years he was a London schoolboy while his father worked in the UK. Hennessy paid traffickers to get back to London but was kidnapped by an armed gang in Libya. He escaped by leaping from a moving truck. Grim as things are here, Hennessy says conditions were far worse in another detention center where there were daily beatings by the guards. If people make noise or if people rush for food, you get bitten. You get bitten. If uh, people want to use the bathroom or if people want to drink water, just make you lie down on your stomach the whole the whole gel and everyone gets about five five everyone gets, everyone gets beaten everyone gets beaten and that's only one risk on the migrant trail through libya the men are pawns to be bought and sold by militias some forced into slave labor it was horrible horrible moment emmanuel was beaten by a gang linked to the traffickers but what pained him most is what he heard them do to two teenage girls. They entered the second room and they raped the girls. They raped two girls. Yeah. And we couldn't do anything because we don't have anything to defend ourselves with. Staff here call them broken men, starved of hope and nourishment. For breakfast, just bread and butter. Officials tell us they have no funds to pay food suppliers so they rely on donations. Outside, the latest arrivals, weary, barefoot, turned around at sea by the Coast Guard, young dreams dashed. Instead of a new life in Europe, returned to the nightmare of Libya. The green paint daubed on by their traffickers, proof they paid their fare, human beings branded like cattle. Now on a lighter note, it seems even royals aren't immune to a few jitters on the first day of school. One day, he'll be king, and the little Prince George was as nervous as any other four-year-old as he arrived at Thomas Battersea under the watchful eye of his father. It's a daunting day for any four-year-old, no matter who you are. And George arrived looking, well, understandably a little nervous. For his first day at the new school in South London, his parents have chosen for him. Dad was there to take his hand and carry his school bag, but not Mum. She had to remain at Kensington Palace, suffering from acute pregnancy sickness. Each day at Thomas's school in Battersea starts with a handshake with the teacher. George knew what was required, as did his father. And then it was time for those shiny new school shoes to head for the classroom, to find the peg for George Cambridge, and to meet the 20 other four-year-olds, boys and girls, who will be in the reception class with him. 
For William, it may have prompted memories of the day 30 years ago when he was taken by his mother for his first day at school. Back then, it was all rather more formal, a boys-only school complete with a school cap. School caps and formality were much in evidence in 1957, when the Queen took Prince Charles for his first day at his all-boys prep school. Charles was, in fact, the first heir to the throne to go to school rather than to be tutored privately. Fast forward to 2017, and George's school offers a broad curriculum with a strong emphasis on human values. George will find that be kind is one of the guiding principles for pupils here, together with courtesy and humility all useful qualities for a future king. And you're watching National MTV News. Trukai Sports is next. We will feature another basketball star as we count down to the FIBA Melanesian Cup. Stay tuned. Welcome to Trukai Sports to Basketball, Apia Muri, a familiar name in PNG Basketball Fraternity. And for the followers of the code, simply an all-round player, exciting to watch. The KSS Southern Flame shooting guard is set to don the PNG colours in the anticipated FIBA Melanesian Basketball Championship, which begins on the 27th of this month. Apia Muri, the 29-year-old from Baimuru Gulf Province, will be among this group of players lining up against their Melanesian rivals for the honor of being crowned Kings of Melanesian Basketball. Apia started playing basketball at an early age and continued on throughout his childhood, attending several international tournaments, including the 2011 Pacific Games in New Caledonia. Batted away by Tahiti and Uri standing there waiting for where he played alongside his brothers Dia and Purari and the recent Pacific Games in 2015 on home soil. We just came back from Solomon's, but that's a club level. Well, my last game was 2015. The past we can see here. Coming from a family of seven and being the eldest, bearing the surname of Muri comes with greater challenge. Apia's dad was also the national rap for PNG back in the 80s. All of me put him inside, inside with you. You kiss him, you can notice like opposite side. Okay. If the ball goes in here, opposite side man uh, He was the one that influenced us in the, the sport of basketball, so yeah, we grew up into it. Basketball is deeply rooted in the family, with father Moi Muri now the coach of national women's team and brother Purari and Dia also in the national team and their younger sister in the women's team. Our training preparation is going well and we're looking forward for the tournament. The six-foot point guard will make his third appearance in the senior men's team and is most likely to lead the PNG side. New, new Caledonia, they, they, they've been the gold medalist on 2011 and the Fiji. So yeah, there are two teams that we're looking forward to meet. Shane Saroya, National MTV Sports. Following the success of the 2015 Pacific Games, both young and old were seeing in their numbers as the campaign to boost beach volleyball in the country started earlier this year. Today, the code has been embraced by many as opportunities arise for top players to represent the country at the international stage. Players, both male and female, are now preparing to attend several training camps and events in Australia. This follows the successful training in Port Moresby last month, assisted by PNG High Performance and organised by Gold Coast Beach Volleyball Institute. The main purpose of the training camp is to organise the athletes for the mini Pacific Games and the Oceania qualifiers in December this year. Uh, in this camp, we will have the men's uh, full team of seven, and the women's full team of five, they will go down for 
the two camps and these camps are very very important for the preparations of our players and then we have another camp in um, in November uh, that will be 11th and 12th and then we have the in New, New South Wales Open. Five teams will head down to Gold Coast Australia for two separate camps starting on the 16th of this month and two Australian Open events later this year. Um, as we all know that uh, Oceania, um, the Commonwealth qualifier is, is in the, uh, December uh, and of course we have the mini games in line with and straight after the, the qualifier. So it's a great opportunity for our beach volleyball at this stage. Killer said the training is crucial for PNG's participation at the Oceania qualifiers in Vanuatu in December as this will determine PNG's place at next year's Gold Coast Commonwealth Games. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. To snooker and 24 players have registered for the 2017 BSP National Minor Snooker titles that queued off in Port Mosby on Wednesday. The players were divided into four groups of six with the final round robin matches to be completed this evening. The semi-finals will be held on Sunday with the two winners to do battle in the final scheduled for 3 p.m. at the Lamana Q Club. Nominations and registration for the major titles close next Monday with the matches for the major titles to begin on Tuesday. Trukai Sports continues after these messages. Don't go away. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. The 24-hour long marathon along the Kokoda track has been postponed to the 31st of September. The marathon is part of the Fuzzy Wazi Kokoda track 75th anniversary celebrations. The marathon will test a runner's endurance all throughout the race, having to run up mountains and on uneven grounds. On the 31st of September to the 1st of October, uh, you're going to be running from Kokoda to Owens Corner. So you run Oro Province, Kokoda Station, by Lusim, by you run Kamkamablo, Owens Corner, Losugeri. And that's 96 kilometers, and you do it under 24. The record stands at 16 hours coming from there. About seven competitors have shown interest in taking part this year. Currently we've got a lot of male runners that are interested. I've got uh, uh, one, six, seven, seven at the moment. I've got seven. Endurance marathon organizer Norris Selu has recommended long distance athletes to take part. A helicopter will be on the lookout for runners who cannot continue the race. We're not going to leave anybody behind. Any stragglers, go to the nearest uh, helipad, we'll pick you up and bring you out. And if you can't make it within the 24 hours, just surrender. Because the helicopters will pick you up. Uh, the last part is uh, any major injuries that need to be addressed, the helicopters will go. And if not, they're still on standby until we do the bunny hop and pick everybody and bring them out. The marathon hopes to attract many participants from around Port Moresby and other provinces. Prize money will be given to the first, second and third runner. But because women will not be taking part, Selu is thinking of giving prizes to five runners. And the prize money is actually for the first runner is 8,000, second runner is uh, 6,000 and the third runner 4,000. But uh, because the women are not coming on board now. If there's no women showing any interest, then I'll just bring it down and make it probably top five, depending on how many numbers I have for, for the males. So at least they get something. You know, you gotta, you got to thank them for running it. It takes a lot of courage to run it. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. To tennis abroad and a new Grand Slam champion will be crowned at the US Open after Sloane Stevens beat fellow American Venus William 6-1-0-6-7-5 in a roller coaster of a semi-final yesterday. Stevens who returned to competition at Wimbledon after nearly half a, a year off because of a foot injury recovered from a second set meltdown to end ninth seed Williams hopes of reaching a third major final this year. Stevens will meet up at Coco Vanui or Madison Keys, who face each other later on. Despite her lack of match play this year, Stevens began confidently and broke for three sets to one. And Williams netted a routine forehand and then went on to win the last three games of the set as the 37-year-old strangely appeared to struggle with serve. Williams was in danger again on her first service game in the second set, but she managed to hold and broke in the next game thanks to Stevens' double fault. 
Stephen showed she was clearly struggling and lost a set to love when she hit yet another unforced error. The 24-year-old, however, got back on track in the decider, taking a 1-0 lead on Williams' serve when she netted an easy volley. But at the end of a 7-minute game, Williams netted a routine volley again to give her opponent a break for 4 sets to 3. But Williams struggled with her volley. Stevens broke for love in the 11th game and followed up on serve to close it out as Williams netted a backhand. Jeremy Wogi, National TV Sports. And that ends Shukai Sports. Don't go away. We have the all-important weather report for the weekend coming up. True Kai Sports. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. Taking a look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours. First of all, in the southern region, mostly fine in Port Moresby, Daru, and Kerama. A shower or two in Alotau. A shower is expected in Popandeta. To the Momasa region, a few showers expected in Leh and well, some showers expected as well in Madang, Wewak and Vanimore. To the New Guinea Islands region, mostly fine in Buka, some showers expected in Kimbe, Kokopo and Rambao, a shower or two as well in Lorangao and Kaviang. And in the Highlands region, Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg, all these major centres can expect showers with morning fog over the next 24 hours. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield, with doing with Dulux. And that's the way it is this Friday, the 8th of September 2017. On behalf of the MTV News team, have a pleasant weekend. Good night.